um i think opening up really especially it doesn't matter if it's like friends or if it's like a um you know boyfriend girlfriend whatever i think opening up is like a big risk um and then also i think sharing my food is one because then like if you like it then that means like next time i have it then you're gonna ask for another piece and then i have to be rude and be like no i don't want to share with you because i shared what you want Previously in Greater Boston. Because my employer has sent me to make sure you agree to have it broadcast live from Redline. Lindsay Coolidge sent you, is that it? Tyrell would secure those balls if it was the last thing he did. I said the spray paint wasn't me, and it wasn't. So you broke in then? You could have done that without dragging me into this. I am really happy about Phil. It's nothing at this point. Redline. Arlington, and Cambridge. from Dorchester. Right. Jamaica Plain. Uh, Rubio. 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 Wellesley. Lowell. Redline. Uh, Worcester. I'm from Somerville. Peabody. Tuxbury. High Park. Roslindale. Andover. Dorchester. New Framingham. Medford. Medford. This is. Lowell. This is. Rivia. Methuen. This is. This is. This is. Greater Boston. This week in Greater Boston, episode 21, Liars in Legardamine. Would you like to know the future? Will I ever have the money I need to live comfortably? Will I ever find true love? Is death stalking me day and night? Should I post this lawn sign? Find out in Third Sight Media's fine family of divinity digests. I've been offered a promotion at my current job, but I wonder about my company's long-term sustainability in the volatile market of cat meme production. Read Financial Futures and gain foolproof insight into economic and industry trends as many as 10.7 years in advance. Play the stock market and win at money. I just want someone to love me. As much as I love them. And my truck. Not gonna happen. Sorry. I suffer a constant creeping dread of my mortality. Every morning when I wake up, I feel as though my life is even shorter than it was the day before. That's accurate! Are you bound for an idyllic kingdom in the sky? A perpetual torment of fire? Or possibly a surreal dreamscape in the astral realms? Find out what the afterlife holds for you in Metaphysical Monthly. I really want my candidate to win the mayoral race in Redline. Will this lawn sign help? Nope. The winner of this election has already been determined by the cosmic threads of fate. But we'll reveal all the twists and turns of this surprisingly chaotic election weeks before they happen in the pages of political prognostication. Read it today. Find out who wins. Then vote. So at this point, I've been down every tunnel by rail and foot. I've walked the length of every train, toured every station. There are a lot of back halls and hidden rooms and secret pathways. I I had no idea. We're going to need cartographers at some point. I mean, I think there are still parts of the red line most people don't even know exist. Parts you haven't even seen on the maps. I even toured that old abandoned route under the common, the original Park Street Tunnels. Creepy place. If anybody's been there in the past six months, I couldn't see any evidence of it. I had to use a crowbar to get myself in. I mean, everything was locked, and that definitely was one of the locks that the city never bothered to give us a key for. So we'll need to get a locksmith down there at some point and just re-key the whole thing. Okay, I'll ask Melissa to take care of that. I had an idea for that space, though. Something Redline doesn't have yet. An art center. Or, or a museum, even. You know, some sort of cultural enrichment. Oh, man, I wish I could think about doing that right now. Oh, you, you know, something for the future. Would you believe we've got people demanding a baseball team? There's an actual petition. Like, that's the one thing Red Line is really missing. Where would we even put a baseball team? Don't you even need a stadium for that? Well, yeah, but yeah, I've actually got a place. Down in Braintree, there's a big park and ride lot. The top floor could maybe house a ballpark. Really? I don't know, Louisa. People love to want things. Doesn't mean we got the money to do it. Charlotte, Chuck Octagon is here to see you. I guess that's my cue. Your cue? This was all your idea. You should stay and suffer through it with me. Ah, nah, sorry. I'm just the idea man. Execution is your department. Go ahead and send him in, Melissa. And come in with him, please. I'll need you to do some scheduling. We'll be right in. Chuck wandered off. I think he just randomly interviewed someone. Anyway, I really do need to go. I've got a date back in JP. A date? Really? Yes. Why is this so surprising? I'm sorry. I didn't mean it like that. It's just sometimes hard to comprehend that other people still have outside lives. I just can't imagine how I'd find the time to date if I wasn't already married. I barely left the house except to give speeches or interviews. Jeez. Don't you ever get cabin fever? I guess I don't. 
It's funny, cabin fever was exactly what got me into this whole mess in the first place. But now I'm just too busy for it. I used to stay home because I had nothing to do. Now I stay home because I've entirely too much to do. <laughs> well, the more things change. Ugh, God, I hate that saying. <laughs> yeah, me too. Well, I suppose you must be very pleased with yourself. And that's me leaving. Smell you later. Have a seat here, Mr. Octagon. Thank you. What am I supposed to be pleased about? You wanted my wedding? You got my wedding. Here we are. Yeah, you kind of sprung that on me on live air. Oh, sure. It was such a big surprise. Yes! Yes, it was. Whatever. Let's just get through this. Melissa, update us. Okay. Well, the efficient is booked. Uh, since the acting mayor will be doing the honors. You're welcome. We've booked the DJ and received a list of preferred musical styles and song requests from the other groom, so music is set... We're leaving wardrobe up to the couple, not our purview. We've scheduled a tasting with three different caterers. The Mex Indian Fusion Place in South Station, the Greco Ramen Place from Porter, or the Bolshevik Sushi Place from Central. The cake is coming from Finale at Harvard Square Station. It'll be a three-layered cake. First layer, amaretto tiramisu. Second layer, Rum-infused carrot cake, and the third layer is just a bowl of rye whiskey garnished with a ginger snap. We've booked a florist from Quincy Center Station. Oh, and we're going to need your wedding colors for the florist and for the table linens. Brown and purple. Brown and purple? Yes. Seriously? Why wouldn't I be serious? No reason, I guess. Those are the colors of the Octagon family crest. It's a noble color combination with a rich history. The Dutch Octagons were maritime explorers. We would even have maps of the coast if not for the Dutch octagons. Wonderful. Brown and purple it is. We're still working on the custom party car you requested. That part might not prove practical. Practicality isn't my concern. The custom party car is essential. It's just that no one has ever designed a convertible subway car before. With the funds my network is offering, you'll get it done. Well, yes. Look, when Andy and I are introduced as Mr. and Mr. Wood Octagon for the first time, as we're passing over the Longfellow Bridge, we are going to be releasing doves. Now, we can do that in a sealed train car, where the doves are going to dive bomb all the party guests, then shit all over the seats before they lethally smash themselves against the windows in a desperate attempt to escape... Or you can make the convertible car happen, and they'll all gracefully exit to the ceiling into open sky in a beautiful metaphor for the peace and love of a happy marriage. Your call. We'll get it done. And the canopy should be purple. We are kind of planning on red to match the train. Red isn't one of my wedding colors. This is going to be a permanent part of the train. Well, you should have thought of that before you blackmailed me into having my wedding on your train. What? Are we done for now? I guess so. Good. What the fuck is he talking about? I don't know, but I'll talk to Gemma. Oh, God. I'm sure it wasn't her. If she's gone behind my back to do something that insane... But I'll find out what I can. I just don't even know what I'll do with her. It'll be fine. I promise. I'll find a way to make it fine. At this point, I think I've been everywhere. I've walked every mile of this city. I've chased every lead, investigated every rumor, and I haven't found anything to corroborate any of it. There are plenty of people squatting in every nook and cranny of the city, but I just don't think Shelmsworth is one of them. All these mayor sightings people keep reporting, they're, they're all bullshit. He's not here. I, I mean, I think, I think that's how urban legends get formed. That's what it is. We're seeing the start of a new urban legend. The vanished mayor who haunts the city he left behind, like a ghost or, I don't know, Bigfoot? I mean, I literally got called to look at footprints one time. Like, I would even know what his footprints look like. Like, like he had such distinctive feet. Shoe size? Um, 11. I can't believe I even know that. I mean, I I, I have been through all the clothes he left behind. No, but... no, I, I mean you, your shoe size. Uh, oh, uh, seven. Oh, God, these are ugly. It's no fun if they aren't. So why are you even still looking for Chelmsworth? It's what I was hired to do. I mean, nobody cares anymore. Charlotte's given up on him. Gemma actively hopes I don't find him, but I was hired to solve a mystery, you know? Find the mayor. Find Gemma's crystal ball. And so far, I've turned up bupkis. Well, speaking of balls, here we are. Lane six is ours. I don't get it. It's just bowling. With tiny balls. Hey, don't judge. 
Oh, I... Ugh, never mind. I am not taking that bait. I can't believe you've lived in Boston for a decade and you've never been candlepin bowling. Okay, so Phil, just explain it. Well, it's not that different, save that you're less likely to throw out your elbow. You get three throws instead of two, and the dead wood stays on the lane instead of getting swept out. Small balls and dead wood. Really? Hey, I'm just a messenger. Don't blame me. Sure, sure. You better not be planning to do that thing where you try to teach me by standing behind guiding my hand so you have an excuse to spoon me in a bowling alley. I swear on my Irish heart I have no intention of spooning you in a bowling alley. Now go on, give it a shot. Not bad, not bad. I think I'm supposed to hit more than three. That was just your first ball. You've got two more. Didn't this place used to have just virtual bowling? Yeah, but that was stupid. Hey, better. I totally missed. I only hit one I'd already knocked down, and it's only by accident that it knocked down any of the others. That's what it's there for. You use the dead ones to take out the rest. Whatever. Winning by accident is totally cheap. Louisa, if you really hate this, we can go do something else. I'm not wedded to the idea of candlepin bowling tonight. There's a movie theater right around the corner. We can just go watch whatever is showing if you'd rather. No, 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 this is fine. I mean, if anything, you seem like you really just want to vent about work. We could go just get coffee. I don't mind listening for a while. Now that's the sweetest offer anyone's made me in ages, but no. You want to teach me some funky-ass bowling, so let's do some funky-ass bowling. I don't want to ask you to do something you don't want to do. <laughs> Trust me. In the hierarchy of things you could ask me to do that I don't want to do, candlepin bowling falls well within the range of reasonable compromises. You're sure? I mean, it's not like you're asking me to break into your rival's home. Uh, has someone asked you to break into a rival's house? No. No, of course not. It's nothing. Wow, that was totally and obviously a lie. Phil, I... I get that we're still at the beginning of this. Between us, I don't expect you to tell me your every embarrassing secret or private thought. I don't want to pry. But if I care about you, and then you say something that suggests reason for me to be worried that you're in some kind of trouble, well, if I care, then I'm kind of obligated to pry. At least a little. And Louisa, I do care about you. And what you just said suggests there's reason for me to worry. It, it's just a thing with work. Gemma, she made you burgle someone? She didn't make me. She just sort of tricked me into going with her. That's kind of worse. She's my friend. Is she? That's a line, Phil. I'm... You're right. I'm sorry. You're right, too. I... I... I it's... I don't know. It's, it's not like we hurt anyone or stole anything. Her intentions were good. I... Or goodish, anyway. Hmm. We got to see a creepy cheese robot. What? I mean, anyway, uh, enough about Gemma. No, 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 wait. You can't just leave me hanging on creepy cheese robot. Ah, uh, we've got all night for that. All right, come on. Let's bowl. What's an example of a big risk that you've taken to help or support another person? And what's an example of a big risk that you've taken for yourself? Giving my husband a chance <laughs> when he had, like, <laughs> no money and no prospects. And it's like, okay, let's take a ride together. Seeing... A boy about my age trying to corner a girl because she didn't want to kiss him or be with him. And I jumped into that not knowing if he had a gun or a knife on him. I worked for a great company that not only loved me but wanted to pay for my education. I wanted to get my degree on my own terms. When you work for a company, they wanted me to work like 40 hours a week and still get a degree. It probably would have took me like six years to get my degree. The risk that I was taking is that I was leaving this company and probably not going to be able to get a job back. I think coming to college was one. Because you know, I had my mindset in senior year of high school that I was done with school and I didn't know, I didn't want to waste my money because I was like, I don't know what I want to be. Like, probably not doing my homework on time. Mm -hmm. That's the, in college, not in high school, in college. That's the biggest risk. Because, I mean, no other college is going to want me with doo doo grades, you know? I guess I speak out actually on behalf of other people all the time. And I speak out probably lots of times when I shouldn't to administration or to board members. I don't know, I guess speaking out against how bad BPS was when I was in BPS and becoming part of groups that were speaking out against how BPS was treating the students and how the education was poor. I was working at the security job. I think I woke up, I was already seven or past seven. And then I was in a rush. As I was trying to leave the house, I stopped and thought for a second. I'm in a rush for what? So I just sent a text to my supervisor and said, 
I'm not coming to work. I, I quit. I'm done. Michael Tate speaking. Michael, this is Gemma Linzer Coolidge. Oh, hey, Gemma. What's up? Are you still at Third Sight? Are you kidding? I hardly leave. They got me so loaded up with extra work, I can barely find the time to change my clothes. Ever since I went down to the Olive Garden. I think we're on to something with that. Yeah, about that. Of course. I can hardly go home now anyways, since someone filled my whole place with Squeezy Stress Balls. What? Yeah, we had a theft here at the office. After they announced that Squeezy Stress Balls were getting cut from the budget, someone stole all the ones we had left. I was pretty upset at first, but I went home that night, and there they were. All of them. Practically overflowing out my front door. I mean... They would have overflowed, except whoever put them there struck up a mosquito net to keep them in. I basically live in a giant ball pit now. Were they trying to frame you? I don't think so. I think it was an earnest gesture. I'm pretty sure I know who did it, honestly. And I appreciate it. But it's kind of hard to get anything done at home now. So I mostly just stay here. Can't you just move them to the garage or something? Garage? I live in one of the hammock apartments at Porter. There's nowhere to move anything. Seriously? But those apartments are horrible. Yeah, I've noticed. Thanks for the heads up, though. Sorry. Sorry. Anyway, I was just calling to ask again if you've had a chance to look around the offices there. I've seen some pretty solid evidence that Third Sight is behind Emily Bespin's campaign, but I don't know why. I don't know what they're planning. How does a snooty blue blood train mayor benefit a bunch of bullshit new age rags? Look, I'll be here way late tonight, and most other nights. I'll take a more thorough look. There's lots of places I can't get into, though. If there's anything to find, it's probably nowhere I have access to. Half the doors around here have secret codes and pass keys that I could never hope to guess. But I'll try. Thanks. Call right away if you find anything. I will. Melissa, hi. What did you do? Um, that is a very open-ended question. You know very well what I'm talking about. Um, I feel like we've just walked into one of those sitcom scenes where you come in here accusing me of something trivial, and I think I know what you're talking about, but I'm wrong, and I end up confessing to something much worse because I think you already know. Well, okay. Yes, that's what this is. It totally is. And you've already blundered it because you pretty much just admitted that whatever it is I'm mad about, you think you've got something worse you ought to be confessing. No, I said that's what this felt like. I never suggested that I actually have anything to confess. Do you have something to confess? No. I don't. Big Newtons, would you stop looking at me like that? Do you know one of the reasons why I'm so good at my job, Gemma? It's because I know when I'm being lied to. I'm practically a human lie detector. Oh, please. Even actual lie detectors are completely full of stuff. They just detect stress, not honesty. Good job picking up on the highly subtle signals that I'm currently fluffing stressed. Gemma, what's even the point of this? Whatever it is, you're going to have to deal with it eventually. At least let me help you. I'll figure it out eventually anyway. You know I will. All right. I guess I'm just going to have to call Charlotte and tell her that you've got something you're keeping secret from me. And you don't want to tell me what it is. Fluffer nutter! Promise you won't tell her. If I tell you, promise you won't tell Charlotte. You help me figure out what to do with this, but you don't tell her. Fine. You promise. I promise. Fine. Tell me your thing, and then I'll tell you mine. You blackmailed Chuck Octagon. God damn it! I didn't even do the thing you thought I did. You didn't? I don't even know what the fluff you're talking about. Someone blackmailed Chuck Octagon to make him hold the wedding in Redline? That's why he agreed to it. 
And he thinks it was Charlotte. And Charlotte thinks it was me. Yep. She thinks I committed blackmail. So you didn't commit blackmail? Of course not. So what did you commit? You really promised not to tell. Gemma, for heaven's sake. Burglary. Gemma, oh my god. But I found the proof I was looking for. Proof that Third Sight Media is backing Emily Bespin. They've bankrolled her whole fluffin campaign. It was their idea for her to run in the first place. Who cares? I... But what difference does that even make? What, you think you're, you're going to take down a politician by proving a corporation donated to her campaign? What world are you living in? Christ! It's not like Charlotte didn't have corporate donors herself. How can you think she's even getting the Red Line renovations funded? Why do you think there are 17 Dunkin' Donuts storefronts scattered across nine stations? She's taken donations from Anna's Taqueria, Henry Bear's Park, Save More Liquors, and it doesn't matter. What you're proving doesn't matter. I'm just trying. You're not helping Charlotte. You're just getting revenge. You can't tell her I did this. Of course I'm going to tell her you did this. But you promised. I lied. But what about loyalty? You want me to be totally loyal to you or to Charlotte? It'll just upset her. It sure as hell will. But what's the alternative? Wait for Bespin to figure it out? Or the press? And let Charlotte get blindsided by this in full view of the entire world? I'm supposed to protect her, Gemma. That's my job. You told me that. But... 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 Not from me. Yeah, well, here we are, though. Uh, I'll tell her. I know. Right. I just... Uh... Don't wait. Just do it. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Dear Olive, I apologize for... Hmm. Dear Olive, I'm sincerely sorry it took me so long to respond to your previous... Dear Olive, I want to let you know that I wasn't ignoring you. It took me a while to respond because this is an advice column, and I was trying to figure out how to give you the best advice. I realize now that all this time... You've been the one giving me advice. Or maybe you've been trying to advise both of us all along. In any event, I want to reiterate that I'm not ignoring you. In fact, I can hear what you're saying perfectly clearly now. And I'm going to try to listen to your excellent advice. Maybe you're ready to listen too. Best. Michael. Oliver West was waiting for a visitor, a family member, his nephew, the youngest son of his elder brother. A reliable young man, actually, loyal to the family. He often ran useful errands for Oliver, errands he wouldn't trust to his more volatile or less resolute minions. She's not his minion. Let's see. Uncle Ollie, I'm downstairs. <sighs> Oliver. My name is Oliver. Why do family always think they have the right to brutalize your name? Oliver stepped into his secret elevator, the one only he and his nephew knew existed. He's the only person you open your door to, isn't he? The one he only used long after hours, after all his publishing employees had gone home. Yes, yes, it's a secret. We get it. The one that shuttled him down to the secret landing between the wet bar and the kombucha vending machine in the break room. Yes, kombucha, break room, we get the picture. Enough with that. The elevator arrives, the doors open, revealing this mysterious, unnamed nephew, who is obviously going to be someone we've met before. Hey, Uncle Ollie! Phil. Hello, Philip. I trust you have some new information. Sure do. She fessed right up. 
Yeah, the mayor's wife and I broke into our rival's apartment together. Let me tell you all about it. So dumb. Oh, I really don't like you. Now, Philip, there's no need to be insulting. Seriously? You've got me gaslighting her daily, but insult is over the line? This all needs to stop, Oliver. Well, yes. We're villains. We do that sort of thing. But we don't have to be hurtful about it. I think your hierarchy of right and wrong might be a little fucked up, Uncle Ollie. Well, yes, your father felt the same way. But let's not dwell on that. You don't like to think of your brother, do you? Anyway, I didn't mean to insult her. I like her, actually. I just think maybe she's not really cut out for the kind of stuff she's gotten herself involved with. But she admitted to the crime, you say? Of how you led his little boy into crime and corruption? She didn't say it was the best been place specifically, but she admitted to breaking into a rail home with Gemma, more specifically as Gemma's accomplice. Family is so important to you, all. Did she give any details that would identify the place as being Bespin's? Any unique details? But how badly do you use your own? Well, there was the cheese robot. Wait, what? A cheese robot. It seems like the guy who lived there is gone. All his shit's packed and vanished, but he left behind this one robot. Looks just like him, but all it talks about is making cheese. Well, yes, that's certainly distinctive. It sounds like perhaps I should check on Emily herself. Well, here's a recording. I don't know how good it'll be, though. We were bowling. Bowling? Yeah, so, you know, there's a lot of background noise. I asked you for a clandestine studio recording, and you chose to conduct this activity in a bowling alley. Well, it's not like a dance club or a movie theater would have been any quieter. Dates are loud, Uncle Ollie. Well, as I recall, when I was courting your Aunt Autumn, museums were still perfectly viable date venues. I proposed in the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, as a matter of fact. Yeah, you've shown me the paintings. But I don't think Louisa would have been as forthcoming in a silent museum, where every word we said would be overheard. The noise creates an illusion of privacy. I did it the way that would get me the information you needed. And it worked. Well, yes. Yes, it did. You're right, Philip. I apologize for faulting your methods. Hello? Who's that? Michael. How should I know? You didn't actually check that the office was empty before you came down. Sloppy. Oh, hey. Who are you guys? Yes. None of your concern. We're the cleaning crew. In suits. We're a fancy cleaning crew. Oh, man. Is that a secret elevator? I knew it! I knew this place had a secret elevator. Ah! I wish I had my trench coat. Oh, Oliver. This is the moment. This is when it all starts to fall apart for you. No, that's not an elevator. Philip. It's a TARDIS? Oh, Philip, please, stop. You're him. You've got it, Michael. You're the publisher. Yes, Michael. I'm the publisher. Oliver West. Good to finally meet you in person. Wow. I've wondered about you. Such a mystery. I mean, we've all wondered. Who keeps this all running? Where do our orders come from? Who's eating the tuna sandwiches? And all those tubes reaching out of the wall, out of the ground, like huge sucker tentacles, like octopuses. Octopi. What? Octopi. It ends in U.S. I'm sorry, Philip, actually, but that's not correct. Sure it is. Like cactus. Yeah, cactus is from Latin. Octopus is from Greek. They're different. Right. It's octopods. Octopodes? Octopodes, actually. Octopodes, if you prefer not to butcher it. Yeah. Uh, Leon taught Octopodes? me that. Octopodes? But I can never pull it off without sounding phony, so I just stick with octopuses. Oh, wonderful. Now that we've sorted that pressing issue... But what about hippopotamus? Hippopotami, right? I think that's Greek, too, it's actually. It's just hippopotamuses. Hippopot... Hip Phil! Hippo Please listen to Oliver just this once. Mike Michael. It's really just hippopotamuses. Oh, hippopotamuses. Hippopotamop. Hippopotamuses? Hippopotamidosis? No. No, no, you're both putting extra syllables in. Hippopotamus. Why are you adding more P's? Hippopotamus. 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 No. Hippopotamus. I don't understand what's happening right now. Hippopotamus. 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 You're overcomplicating this. No, it's... No. Hippopotamus. Hippopotamus. Philip, what have I told you about? Talking over me, Philip. Hippopotamus. Philip. Hippopotamus. Hippopotamus. 
Philip, would you join us? Sure, Uncle Ollie. Don't, Michael. The green button there, Michael. Why don't you do the honors? Michael, what are you doing? 811-549-176-10-3-12-2. Here we go. Greater Boston is written and produced by Alexander Danner and Jeff Van Driesen with recording and technical assistance from Mark Harmon. If you're enjoying Greater Boston, please consider donating to our Patreon campaign, where you can receive early access to new episodes, exclusive annotated transcripts, and patron-only bonus audio. In order of appearance, this episode featured Rich Wentworth as the Third Sight Media spokesman, Julia Propp as Luisa Alvarez, Summer Unsen as Charlotte Linzer Coolidge, Tanya Milojevic as Melissa Weatherby, Jeff Van Driesen as Chuck Octagon, Michael Melia as Phil, James Oliva as Michael Tate, Braden Lamb as Leon Stamatis, and Mike Linden as Oliver West. Also featuring Mike McQuilkin, Mike Linden, Mark Harmon, and Ben Flaumenhaft as Third Sight Commercial Voices. Interviews recorded with real Greater Boston residents. Charlie on the MTA recorded by Emily Peterson and Dirk Tiedy. Tam Lin set, including Tam Lin, composed by Davey Arthur, Catharsis, composed by Amy Can, and The Fatal Rum Punch, composed by Liz Donaldson, performed by Dirk Tiedy. Child Grove, performed by Adrienne Howard and Dirk Tiedy. Shove That Pig's Foot a Little Farther in the Fire, performed by Adrienne Howard, Emily Peterson, and Dirk Tiedy. He Who Destroys Everything by Art of Escapism. Drums by Jim Johansson. Additional music and sound effects used from public domain and Creative Commons sources. Be sure to check out the hilarious interdimensional comedy Hadron Gospel Hour by our guests Rich Wentworth and Mike McQuilkin. Episode transcripts will be posted online at greaterbostonshow.com. His, his feeling is that because people feel like no one can hear them because it's so loud. Hmm. Interesting. Well, now I know if I want to manipulate people. <laughs> Never going to the bowling alley with you, Alexander. Hippopotamum <laughs> modes. Phil. <laughs> oh, oh, that's it. Hippopotami. <laughs> wow, that is fucking hard. Yeah, dude. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you, Alexander. Yeah. Yeah. The new name of the scene. Uh, right. Okay.